the second session of this morning. And the next speaker is Giovanni Scalmani from Gaussian in the US, who will tell us about a new way of using existing DFT functionals in relativistic calculations. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to this uh, uh, special edition. Happy birthday, Enzo, of the winter modeling. Uh, I'm not Mike Frisch. This is the reason why Mike is not here. That was the weather map over New England at the time he was living. He was taking his flight. This is Gaussian. This is Newark Airport. So that's winter storm Athena. Uh, I have a tree across my backyard now. Uh, so I'm the other guy. I'll try. He sent me, my, he sent me his slides. These are not entirely his slides, uh, but most of the uh, content is there. Uh, I'm going to try to to talk about uh, something that we have been struggling with uh, in the last few years, and uh, basically trying to move some, trying to do some baby steps in the direction of uh, a relativistic treatment, um, a relativistic treatment of. Um, extension of quantum chemistry uh, as we do it. Um, there have been other attempts to extend the use of, well, one of the big issue in this context is the fact that many, a lot of work has been done in DFT uh, for non-relativistic calculation. And one of the issues is, uh, can we use the same functionals that have been developed for non-relativistic calculation in relativistic calculation? And there has been other attempts to do that. Uh, we finally came out with something slightly different that, at least in our opinion, uh, works a little better, at, at least for our purposes. And I'll try to show some results about, about that. First of all, one slide about uh, the reason why we are here. The first four points are almost verbatim from Mike. Uh, ENSO has an impressively broad range of research interest. We already heard about it. And he has achieved international recognition in, in, in every single one of them. Uh, from far away from where we see it, uh, him being here at the Scuola Normale, we couldn't think of a better fit. Uh, he has been a very valuable collaborator of Gaussian for 15 years now, uh, and there is still no hand in sight. Uh, he has trained many productive scientists. Uh, many of them are in this audience, uh, and that's just a fact. And uh, the last line is by me, and a personal, very deeply felt thank you for everything I learned from you. Uh, why relativity? Well, because the periodic table doesn't end with Krypton. Uh, we already know that. Uh, relativistic treatment is necessary for every element. If you do a simple-minded uh, toy uh, exercise, you figure that if you don't contract the Born radius uh, as the atomic number increases, sooner or later the electrons will break the speed of light. Uh, what happens is that they don't, of course. Uh, core orbitals contract. Uh, starting from the second transition row on uh, correlation energy, that we care a lot, so much about, uh, counts less than relativistic corrections. And uh, the truth is that it's very difficult to get even the ground state right for many heavy elements. We kind of know how to do the right thing, but that doesn't really help in practice. <laughs> uh, at least that was our experience. Uh, we know we need to use Dirac Fock, we know we need to use four component spinners, we know a, a number of things. But there are a lot of technical issues. And, uh, and this is what we found out. If you want to stretch the standard way of doing quantum chemistry toward a relativistic treatment, this is a very hard, very time consuming, often unrewarding uh, pro effort. Uh, and this, again, is a, is a tale about our first baby steps in that direction. There are several approximations to do relativistic calculation. There are approximate removal of small components, uh, Douglas Crowless, uh, normalized determination of small components, uh, uh, Jürgen Gauss, uh, X2C method, 
Uh, the dust is not settled yet. Uh, we are not expert in this field. We are trying to get into this field. So it's not clear to us which one is, if, if any of these approximation is emerging as preferred with respect to the ad. There are, there are effective core potential based on four component atomic calculation, but again, it's a lot of work and we'd like them to be available for many elements. Uh, they are not. There are scalar relativistic correction, uh, Dagra core S, second order, Zora has been very successful. They account for core contraction, they improve the predicted energies and geometry, but they don't help to solve all the problems. There are extensions of this few approximation to include more physics, and of course the first step is spin orbit. Uh, if you want to do an all electron calculation, it's pretty messy. You should try to include two electron terms, which are messy. And for somebody who does programming for a living, it's a trauma <laughs> when you start to do relativistic calculation. Because suddenly, you, are no longer, you no longer have spin blocking, you no longer have uh, real, uh, real molecular orbitals, everything becomes complex, and things start to uh, be uh, pretty different from what they looked like the day before. Uh, there are spin orbit there are spin orbit ECPs, but again, uh, these are done for some element and, and for some combination of basis function and, and basis set and ECP. Uh, our goal is, of course, this one. Uh, we would like to do the same stuff we do for the non relativistic case in the same user proof way, uh, with the same robustness, the same accuracy, the same easy to use, and if at all possible, the same. Uh, performance, uh, which means that we like to do the same kind of calculation, geometry optimization of large and floppy molecules, compute frequencies, compute second and higher order properties for, for spectroscopies, and unfortunately the same rule applies. If you want a spectrum, if you want to do an harmonic spectrum, you need a certain kind of accuracy on the second derivative, let's say 10 to minus 6. Uh, that means that you need to get to the minimum using a gradient that is accurate to 10 to minus 8, which means that your energy needs to be accurate to 10 to minus 10, and your integrals to compute the energy needs to be accurate to 10 to minus 12. That, that, those are just the rules. There are really no way around this. So the non-relativistic treatment, we know how things look like. S squared and SZ are give you good quantum numbers to classify wave functions. The Hamiltonian is real. I know, usually a single determinant is enough, uh, not every time. Uh, orbitals are real, and orbitals are pure alpha or beta spin. Uh, the, the alpha and beta density matrix are really the two diagonal block of a more complex density matrix, but really, the density matrix and the equation to find it are already blocked by spin. And the magnetization density, which is uh, a real vector, uh, happens to point every, for every point in space in the same direction. With respect to this uh, magic arbitrary spin quantization axis. Uh, the magnitude of the magnetization density vector along the spin quantization axis is what many of us call the spin density and suddenly the vector field magnetization density is turned into a scalar field. We care only about the length of the magnetization density, not its direction. A relativistic treatment is different. Uh, not so fast in calling things molecular orbitals. You have spinors, you have two or four component complex spinors, the Hamiltonian is complex, the Hamiltonian no longer commutes with S squared and SZ, your wave function cannot be labeled with uh, quantum number for uh, like uh, SZ or S squared. Uh, you can do two component approximations. The orbitals and the Hamiltonian are still complex, and you have spin orbit from uh, the uh, sigma p term from the Dirac equation, uh, which is the new bit, the first new bit of physics that you can put in. Uh, but again, the orbitals are no longer pure spin, so you, you cannot separate alpha and beta anymore. Now, DFT. 
Well, there are many functional that that's just another fact. <laughs> Somebody said many, way too many. I don't know. Uh, not my job, really, except when they ask for them. Uh, most of them have been developed and parameterized doing density matrix functional theory. Uh, our unknowns are the elements of the density matrix. Uh, is not really the density itself as a function. Uh, all functional assumes that the density matrix is spin blocked, and all functional depends on, an, on a small number of variables, alpha and beta density, free combination of alpha and beta density gradient, kinetic energy density for alpha and beta, Laplacian for alpha and beta, and things, and, and there are a few things now that let us think that uh, if you put tau in, you have to have the, the paramagnetic current in there to have proper gauge invariance and things like that. But anyway, it only, all, all standard functional only use and care about alpha and beta densities. They don't care, they assume that the alpha beta block of the density that is non-zero in a proper two component treatment is just zero. And by the way, one thing that I realized recently, but maybe many of you have realized a long time ago, the fact that we take the square, the square of the length of the, of the density gradient also makes sure that the energy is, is rotationally invariant with respect to rotation of, of the molecule. Otherwise, taking the gradient by itself, you will have to solve a problem of rotational invariance. If you take the square root of, of the length, the, the, the square of the length, you get rid of rotational non-invariance problem. Now, in two collinear spins, if you want to do non-collinear spins, which is the same saying if you want to do a two-component calculation. Again, all the blocks of P are non-zero. Uh, and a very simple state, like a doublet, looks very different. The density matrix of a, of a doublet looks very different if it's aligned on the z-axis or if it is aligned on the x-axis in spin space. This is the density matrix for alignment on the z-axis, only P alpha, alpha is non-zero. And this is if the same state is aligned on the x-axis, all elements are non-zero. Now, does the energy change? No, not if your Hamiltonian doesn't include spin orbit, and not if your Hamiltonian doesn't include a magnetic, an external magnetic field. So these two quantities should give you the same energy. You should be able to do the calculation in either one of these arbitrary spin quantization axes and get the same thing. And even better, if you start from different non-collinear guess and want to converge the same collinear state, the spin axis in which this collinear state finds itself at the end of the calculation should really not matter. So any robust implementation should give you this. Now, again, there are many functionals. Uh, but truth is, some of them, many of them, works pretty well for light elements. They do. People use them, do productive things with them. Now, of course, uh, should we throw them all away and start developing functional that understand the scalar field charge density and the vector field magnetization density? You wish. In reality, nobody is doing this. So is there a is there a physical justifiable, numerically robust way of using the existing functional for non-collinear, two-component spin density functional theory calculation? Uh, again, and I'm not an expert here, but my understanding is that it is not even clear how to do LDA for the, spin for the ground state of the spin polarized uniform electron gas, which contains uh, spin spirals. So, we don't have LDA for that, which is the, the basic system for which you will do um, uh, a proper treatment of the magnetization vector density in DFT. So the question is, if the functional depends on this small number of variables, we change the labels because now it's no longer alpha and beta, we call them plus and minus. 
how we do compute these variables from the fully non-collinear densities to component densities. Well, we, we must try to include as many elements of the proper physics as possible. Uh, we need to ensure that all the standard collinear results are reproduced seamlessly with respect to any arbitrary axis of quantization in spin space, uh, which means it must be completely invariant with respect to rotation in spin space. And of course, hopefully, the, we want a, a, a formally robust, numerically stable, continuous differentiable approach. Uh, this is how the non-collinear density and magnetization vector density look like. Uh, the, the charge density, just the sum of the alpha and beta density matrix elements with the basis function, with the atomic basis function. The vector magnetization densities, the XY and component are the real and imaginary part of the alpha beta block. The Z component is what looks like the spin density if these two will be zero. So the difference between alpha and beta. Uh, beyond LDA, things get a lot more interesting because the gradient of the particle density is still a nice vector in Cartesian space. The gradient of the magnetization density is a strange thing. It's just nine numbers. It's a matrix with one index giving you the Cartesian component and the other index giving you the spin component. Uh, why we can't use the standard definition of the variables for to use standard DFT for non-collinear calculation? Well, because the two states that, were, that are supposed to be equivalent will give you completely different rho alpha and rho beta. So if you put these two into the functional or these two into the functional, you get two different numbers, clearly. And again, previous attempt to generalize exchange correlation functional beyond LDA to non-collinear uh, DFT we want to produce this variable from this. Now, if you count here, you have 2, 5, 8, uh, 11, 12. So, and here you have more numbers. You have, you, have, you have more information here than here. In, in, in the solid state physics community, has been known for a long time how to do LDA. It's so-called Kubler tricks or Kubler rotation. So basically, you since the energy doesn't depend on the orientation of the uh, spin frame in absence of spin orbit, etc., you just redefine your spin frame everywhere to be so that the local magnetization is aligned along the positive z-axis. And if you do that, what you do, you basically turn your vector again locally, point by point, using a different reference frame into a scalar. And you define your plus and minus densities like this. Uh, to do this, you formally need a rotation in R3. You can do the same with a rotation, of course, in SU2. If you start from the density matrix written like this, actually, you don't even need the rotation because you just diagonalize the matrix. You don't need the eigenvectors to compute the energy. You just need the eigenvalues. Uh, that removes one uh, numerical issue of defining the rotation matrix. What happens with GGAs? <laughs> uh, if you rotate in spin space grad M with the same rotation matrix, you get another grad M, which is still nine numbers, potentially different from zero. You, you haven't achieved much. If you take the derivative of the density eigenvalues, you get this thing, which is which contains, this is the scalar product over the spin component, the little circle, instead of the dot for the scalar product on, on the Cartesian component. Now, this guy here is it's a projection that basically picks out the component of, of the gradient of the magnetization along the local magnetization direction. Uh, this is a little tricky. You can do that, and you get the same result in all spin frame uh, but not because we are invariant, but because we have a precise recipe to, to get to the same spin frame every time. Uh, and if you want to do things a little 
with the right names, you have to recognize that this projection is only a, a piece of the covariant derivative of M. Because you need a covariant derivative because you, you are changing the reference frame as you move from one point to the other. And, and this guy is only a piece of this and not a complete covariant derivative. Uh, which elements are picked out depends on the unit vector in the direction of the magnetization. And this is a numerical case of death. Because for small m that change by a tiny bit moving a little bit on the side, you have a change at 1, 10 to minus 9 on one component, the difference in the unit vector, of course, is finite. So as the magnetization becomes an infinitesimal, the unit vector never does. It just becomes undefined. And so which projection you are taking becomes ill-defined. And this is interesting because it's the formalism that is ill-defined. There is no algorithm that, that can fix this. You cannot use a projection over the local unit vector of magnetization. The instability is not a problem for SLDA. It just means that plus and minus becomes the same. There is no spin polarization, and that's it. The instability of M hat is, is this is very wrong, sorry, is a big problem, cut and paste, is a big problem for GGAs, is the big problem for GGAs, because small m, again, does not mean small m hat, it just means undefined m hat. And so you are basically picking random elements of grad m. Now, this is, is not perceived as a problem by people who do uh, magnetic material in a solid state, because the magnetization is hardly everywhere zero. That's the only thing you care about. You have your magnetization vector that goes around and can be a little smaller, a little larger, but you, you don't immediately worry about him, the magnetization vector going to zero. If you do non-collinear spins in a molecule, you have plenty of reason for which the magnetization vector can go to zero. For a symmetry plane, in the tail of the density, so, similar issues are also present for kinetic energy dependent functional and, and Laplace independent. What happens when you try to implement this? What happens is that you get to 10 minus 5 in the change in, in the density, which corresponds to basically 10 to minus 6 in the energy, and then you don't converge anymore. You, you, you simply wobble around because you are selecting these random components of the magnetization gradient every time, a different one. Uh, the SCF becomes hopelessly confused. It doesn't know what to do. And again, unfortunately, this is unacceptable for us because we want, we need 10 to minus 9 on, on the density to, to do what we, need, what we want to do. Uh, you can dump this oscillation defining the magnetization like this which, of course, is zero when, when this is zero, but then you, the, your derivative don't blow up. The problem is that to be robust in every case, the damping has to be big enough that then you don't recover the, the unrestricted one component result. So your formalism doesn't reduce to the one component limit correctly, the collinear limit correctly. And this is what we, this was what we found out when you were trying to move our baby steps in this direction. Uh, many authors acknowledge these issues with GGAs. They propose approximations, and they're very clear in their paper about what they're doing. Some others don't. <laughs> and, and of course, then you wonder, what are you doing wrong? <laughs> that, 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 that. And we have, been doing, we have been wondering that for a long time. Uh, seriously, the problem is that if you do one of these approximations, typically, you achieve self-consistency. You don't achieve a variational minimization. And that means that if you want to do gradient in presence of self-consistent but not really variational solution, you would have to solve the response equation to do the gradient. And of course, this is also a big problem. This is, a, this is like the physicist's corner. If you the correct physics predicts that there should be a non-vanishing local magnetic torque, which means that the exchange correlation field, which is the functional derivative of the energy with respect to the magnetization vector, should be 
non-zero locally, but should be zero globally. If you have a vanishing local magnetic torque, you cannot do spin dynamics. There is nothing that makes the spin turn. Um, but certainly you want the integral of that torque to be zero everywhere, otherwise your molecule will be rotating. Uh, LDA and the generalization of LDA to non-collinear spin, unfortunately, doesn't give you this torque by definition. It gives you BXC always parallel to M. The previous generalization of GGA that I saw you, even if you implement them in a stable way, and you can't, also gives you a vanishing local magnetic torque. So you're missing one piece of the physics. And one of the proof was given by Gross when he did the exact exchange in its OAP form, optimized effective potential form, and it shows that if you do exact exchange in the optimized, potential, optimized effective potential form, you actually get exactly a non-vanishing local magnetic torque and a globally vanishing integral. So the right physics is there in the, in the exact exchange, but it's certainly not there in the available generalization of standard collinear DFT functional to the non-collinear uh, states. So what we tried to do in the end, and this is, of course, the, this is the result of a lot of trial and error. What we convinced ourselves is that you need to use invariance to form these variables. You have to use invariance with respect to rotation both in spin and uh, real space. You can form the size of M, the size of grad N. You can form this strange thing here, which is a, a scalar. You can form this other strange thing here. And if you can define these variables in terms of these, then your variables are, have the proper invariance and your energy has the proper invariance. Now, can you find such a definition that gives you the, the proper uh, collinear limit and other properties? So for LDA, we already know how to do that. For GGAs, we propose these definitions of the gamma quantities. These are just combination of those invariants. Uh, there is a strange beast here which is a sine function of this product, which I'll try to explain why it's there. And similar expressions are available for tau and Laplacian. What happens? Well, first of all, if you define the variable this way, you take wholesale all the standard existing functional and you try to use it for non-collinear calculation, including, of course, without any problems, hybrids, global hybrids, range-separated hybrids, meta-GGAs, etc. If you noticed, we don't throw away anything. All the information contained in these numbers is encoded in some way, is passed on to the functional through uh, this other definition of, the, of these gammas. It reduces to the proper collinear limit along any direction, not just z or x or y, whatever, one. It is properly invariant. M hat is out of the picture. You no longer project around on the local magnetization direction. And you get something which is numerically stable when the magnetization goes to zero. Uh, there is the strange sign function because if you think about it, n plus and n, uh, sorry, rho plus and rho minus, Rho plus is always, by definition, bigger than Rho minus. But in real life, the density alpha can be smaller than the density beta. So if you, when you send Rho plus minus to the collinear limit, you have an absolute value where you're picking a sign. You have a sign, uh, you have an arbitrary sign to, to, to pick. So when you send the gammas to the collinear limit, you have another sign which is arbitrary. So this sign function here ensures that if rho plus goes to alpha, gamma plus plus goes to alpha, doesn't go to beta. So it's ensured consistency between the spin label in the collinear limit. Physicist corners. This is how the magnetic exchange correlation field looks like. 
it's, it's messy because you do an integration by parts. You end up with uh, second derivative of the functional, second derivative of the variables. You don't need this to compute the energy. But if you want to see it and evaluate the torque, then you have to go through the exercise of evaluating this mess. Interestingly, this is not in general parallel to M. This LDA part here, it is. But this other mass here, it's not. So you get a non-vanishing local magnetic torque. And you can prove it, through simple algebra, that the zero torque theorem is satisfied nevertheless, globally. And also numerically, you can see it. You integrate the quantity and you get zero. Uh, this is the toy problem we solved first. Three chromium atom equilateral triangle. We want a state where the magnetization points outside the triangle uh, in, in a different direction on every chromium atom. So we do the calculation. We com convince the calculation to converge where we want. We evaluate the expectation values of Sx, Sy, and Sz, and we found them all to be zero. Because if you combine this free red vector, that's what you get. S squared was returned to be 3.89. And we look at that, and I didn't, but Mike realized that that was pretty close to a quartet. So we said, what are the other three microstates of this quartet? And these are the other microstates of the quartet. They are not connected by a rotation in spin frame. They are connected through inversion in spin axis, in the sign of one or two spin axis. These are all degenerate, because they are microstates in a quartet. Uh, but if you go through the centers in the same way, you find that the magnetization rotates in different ways. In two cases, the, the blue arrow is the elicity of the magnetization. Two of them go clockwise, two of them go counterclockwise. Again, interesting, if you put spin orbit through for further Dirac, uh, Douglas Kroll S uh, one electron Hamiltonian, you break symmetry of this quartet, and you, you, break, you break the genesis of the quartet according to the elicity of the magnetization. What all of this means, I'm not entirely sure, but it was pretty neat and was you know, sticking together pretty nicely. All these microstates have the same expectation values, so I don't even know how to distinguish them uh, from the calculation, because the energy is the same, the expectation value of the, of the spin operators are the same. Uh, this is the nice picture for state A. The red arrows are the normalized A. The blue arrows are the normalized exchange correlation field. They are not everywhere collinear. They exert a torque. The color map is the magnitude of the torque. And the four microstates have, of course, very different vector fields, but they have the same torque field in absolute value. If you take into account the sign, the one with one elicity have the same sign, the one with the other elicity have the mirror image across the plane of the uh, chromium. Uh, this has finally been published in JCTC. And of course, the next step is the extension to periodic system to do spin frustrated material. This has been done with uh, Gustavo Scuseria and uh, Irek Bulik, his postdoc. Submitted to Physical Review B. Uh, we do periodic starting from non periodic. So we do all that we can in real space. We go to Fourier space only to do uh, the, the, the final K integration of the Fock matrix for diagonalization. Uh, we break the matrix in real and symmetric component, uh, in, in symmetric and antisymmetric matrices, real and imaginary. If you do collinear non-periodic, you have two lower triangular real matrices, alpha, alpha real symmetric, and beta, beta real symmetric. That's the only one that contributes to the energy. If you do non-collinear non-periodic, you have eight lower triangular matrices. The real symmetrically imaginary antisymmetric part of the diagonal blocks and hold the four pieces of the off-diagonal blocks. And only the symmetric ones contributes to EXC, except if you have the current, but that's not for today. The periodic collinear, of course, 
the symmetric matrix is the infinite one, so as long as you are off the diagonal in terms of cell index, you have a square non-symmetric matrix. Uh, the generalization to non-collinear is similar. You have a bunch of triangles you have to combine in, in some way with the integrals to give you uh, the Artifoc exchange, the Coulomb, and EXC. And this is the nice picture. This is chromium-free but periodic now. And we get more or less the same. Uh, this picture has a, a number of variables in there. So I did the first one, Erek did this one, so the colors are different. But basically the message is the same. Uh, the sign of BXC is also flipped, so here they are anti-parallel rather than parallel, but the message is the same. You have a non-vanishing local magnetic torque. Uh, you can represent BXC, of course, only for GGAs, because when you do meta-GGAs, the integration by part trick doesn't work anymore. When you do hybrids, you have a non-local potential, etc. So the nice picture is available only for, for GGA, but the, but the fact that we found a non-vanishing local magnetic torque, I don't know exactly the quality of that number, but it's certainly a qualitative difference with respect to previous generalization. Conclusions. New approach to extend collinear density functional to non-collinear relativistic calculation. Proper invariance, more of the correct physics, crossing our fingers, that is meaningful. Numerically robust. And of course, as I said, this opened a viable route for us to take wholesale all the work done in, the, in functionals development and use it at least in two component relativistic calculation. That's the good news. The bad news is that, that you need to find these non-collinear states and that's not easy to do because, uh, because the guess wave function is to be non-collinear and break symmetry right away. There is no way the SCF will find a non-collinear state if your starting point is collinear, unless you have spin orbiting there, of course. Uh, if you think about a doublet in a non-collinear framework, it's infinitely degenerate. So you need to be able to deal with a lot of degeneracy and not get confused when you minimize the energy. The SCF needs to realize that two completely different densities are just connected by a rotation in spin space. Uh, you need true general artifact, general consham stability analysis because if you are lucky, like you typically are, you have a, an energy manifold where there is a UHF state here and your true ground state is non-collinear underneath, but you can't break through, you have to get there for another route. Uh, we need to implement Tiger functional derivative, linear response. You will get spin flip TDDFT for free at that point because you can connect different spin multiplicity through the non-collinear uh, transition density matrix. And we need to combine this with relativistic treatment. And these are the people involved at, that have been involved at, at any point with this work. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, there is time for a couple of very short questions or comments. It's a very naive question. You, you have been talking about um, helicity. But I'm, about? No, the problem is that I, I see just the rotation. I, I, I don't see the third dimension which define helicity. And because if you're going up or well, down... We, you're, you're honestly, we were looking for something that would differentiate these states, right? And so what we figured is that if you go through the centers in clockwise manners, and you follow how the magnetization rotates, in this one, it rotates in the clockwise manner. In this one, if you go through the centers in this way, you see that the vector rotates the other way. I don't know, maybe it's not the right term. I, it's the sign of the torque. Okay, let's call it this way. If felicity is a problem, it's the sign of the torque between the magnetization and the... 
No, I didn't know helicity has, 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 had many other implications. Maybe I should have, but uh, it's the sign of the torque between the two fields. Let's put it this way. Thank you. <laughs>